Okay, well, I'll, I'll start with some of my questions. Um, before we get into some of the more meatier issues, um, I think it's interesting, uh, and maybe for people who are out there uh, working in, 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 in agencies, maybe, to go into a little bit more detail on the shift of, of how agencies are working. Uh, up to now, agencies, uh, traditional agencies, uh, work around the concept that they sort of defend and they create their campaigns around this sort of strong concept and then they, they roll out all this advertising that goes around this concept and they can put it into social media, but they're sort of guardians of some sort of brand idea that they feel they've created. I think both, the, both these cases are, are signs of how uh, you both launch no? into the general public an idea and they take it away from you. Um, is that the future of communication? Is that, is that what's going to be happening in the future? Is that old advertisers like me, should I be taking note? I, th I think that um, one big uh, misconception is that sort of the new uh, makes the old go away and it lacks value. I mean, we use, not in the curator's case, we have no bought media. But in almost all of our other clients, when we do uh, projects for them, we, we do buy uh, media because it has an amplification uh, effect which is uh, really, really good. And also, I think it has a value because you, as in this campaign, you reach a very cer certain target group, which in Sweden is very progressive, the Twitter community and the media and the journalists. But it's not like everybody's watching Twitter on Friday night. Uh, and if you want to reach out to probably a, a wider target audience, uh, I think uh, traditional media is brilliant. Uh, and uh, I mean, there's, there's something good with the screaming and interrupting as well, if you do it in a nice way. I think from an, another point of view also, there's a sort of uh, advertising creatives are well known for having uh, big egos. Uh, designers, no. Only, only advertising people. Uh, and here there's a sort of generosity behind the idea of giving your idea to people. Mm. No? Do you think, does that, does that define also a new sort of creative, Miles? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I think what's happening, like I think first there was, there was this kind of shift from to traditional to sort of new media. And now I think we're, we're, in, a, we're in a stage where all media is being used equally but it's the type of thing that we're doing with that media. So if, like, if we quote this, um, this other example, uh, Small Business Saturday in the US, that was a, a traditional media campaign. There was nothing digital really about it, except they used digital channels to kind of like pull everything together. And um, it wasn't about being interactive, but brands and consumers are kind of doing projects together. That's one thing. Um, the, the other thing is like, we're giving, we're giving great ideas or good ideas um, over to people and they're actually taking them to the next level, which is great. Um, so in a way, we're, we're increasing our workforce. I mean, we see it with, with curators. I mean, there's been 80 people, you said, 86 people that have given up a week of their lives. Um, with Ecosphere, we can write all those tweets or we can like, somehow construct all of that. Um, so, so, so bringing more people into the campaign to help build it um, <clears throat> is definitely, it's definitely a way of making you know, advertising you know, reach further and, and projects to be more punchy. But it's not necessarily a thing about uh, like being a digital campaign. Just going back to the, to the other question. I think uh, campaigns nowadays are stopping to be ad campaigns, stopping to be less and less about advertising and more being useful and you know, having relevance. And, and people are, are coming and um, getting into ideas that they find good ideas uh, that they want to be part of. So, in a way, we, we don't just hand our ideas over to the public. Um, we kind of try to attract them, um, and so they can help us, you know, pump it up into something bigger. Yeah. <clears throat> Continuing on from that, um, as this sort of battle, no, this sort of uh, comparative between traditional advertising and what we've seen today, um, Traditional uh, advertisers, creatives, make brand promises, no? We say, buy this product and it'll wash uh, whiter than white. Uh, and then we drop our responsibility, no? We've, we, we've said it, the client told us that, and we've said that 
No, we've done a great campaign, and everybody now knows that this brand washes whiter than white. Uh, what's the difference with what you do? I think, I think um, um, the thing is, since you can't control the conversation because people have their own channels, uh, that reputation that will occur if you lie or do uh, too much of a makeup job on a promise that is not being delivered, uh, it has become very expensive. So I think it's nice with promises that are good if the delivery is good, but usually because of this fact that people have their own channels, um, it's increasingly smarter to work a little bit more on the delivery part than on the makeup of promises part. Uh, that's why I think uh, not only the advertising industry, but companies themselves are starting to think. I mean, first they thought, let's own the channel because you buy it. And then they, when social media came 10 years ago and got really big, like eight years, seven years ago, uh, they were all talking about earned media. Uh, and now they understand that it's all about uh, earned business because that's in the, in the end the result. Uh, it was a, one of my favorite comp competitors that nicked that, or, uh, uh, coined that phrase the other day, so homage to them, but I, I truly believe that. It's, it's cheaper to do a good delivery in a creative, compelling, interesting way. The advertising will be so much better, uh, and the consumer will appreciate it so much more. Uh, so the age of doing a nice solution, uh, relying on storytelling or wit or packaging, I think is in a way going away. What do you think, Miles? Yeah, I mean, we had you know, in the lunch break. I already, you know, mentioned this thing where we say all the words are gone, all the words have been taken. You know, people have been writing great headlines and great campaign lines since like the 50s and the 60s. And, you know, if you write a great piece of copy and you put it in Google, it turns up, you know, someone said it, someone, it belongs to someone. All the words belong to brands now. And washing whiter than white, I could probably name 10 brands that, you know, use that. So everything kind of, you know, when you, when you just build your house on words, um, you either become, you know, generic or, like as Patrick said, it can backfire. You could lie. I think what's amazing is in the last, you know, the last year, the most powerful campaigns that we see are not advertising campaigns, and they're not based on words. And I think if you, ima if you imagine this, this picture of Felix Baumgartner, you know, in outer space, getting ready to jump, I mean, there was, there's no words there. But there's an image, and it's not a promise, it's an action, like you said. So Red Bull didn't say, well, we're going to make you, you know, achieve something you couldn't normally achieve, or we're not just going to give you the energy or the power to reach your dream. We're actually going to pay probably close to 100 million US dollars to help realize that. So it's, it's, brands are more and more active, and the ones that are active and that do things are the ones that are winning, right? So maybe answering one of these questions now that are up, on the, up behind us, the, uh -oh. this, this, this honesty, yeah. uh, or this being genuine, uh, through talking to people means, what do you say, walking the talk? No, it means uh, actually being true to people and showing that your product actually can do what you say it does, not just making the promises. That's more or less the conclusion, no? I think then comes the question of how do you use your craft and do it in a beautiful, compelling way. But to me, that's hygiene. It's, not, it's no longer the hero of the creative process. It's hygiene. Because you can do projects like Ecosphere really shitty and lousy, and you can do Curate to Sweden, uh, and I've seen it in a shitty way. Mm -hmm. and you, or you can do it in a way that it actually has its own economy, so to speak, the way it's handled and the way it's uh, uh, being presented and narrated. And I think that still is something our industry, traditional industry, is really, really good at. I mean, we know how to tell a story in 30 seconds. Uh, and we know how to uh, do something compelling in uh, 140 characters, if we have to. Uh, so that quality still exists. It's just that we can't rely only on that. Yeah, you said something when we were talking at lunch of maybe the, new, the part of this, this new way of approaching uh, 
the communication is getting closer to, to the brand, but getting closer to the product. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Um, I'm saying that, uh, I mean, we're, we're a small agency. We have uh, like 13 clients. And on all of them, we do a lot of product development. That's not something that tr that's traditionally done by an agency. Sometimes it's just tweaking, so it will become more communicative. And sometimes it has more of a fundamental uh, importance. But we work a lot closer with the product development than uh, I say an ordinary agency do, uh, which means that we need to know more about their business and their processes and their distribution, all the boring stuff. Uh, but funnily enough, good communicators are really good inventors. Uh, so I, I, I truly believe that if you want to do things, act on things, improving them, uh, you, you really have to be in there with the product, uh, which excludes a lot of potential uh, clients from us because they're not interested. Well, that's, that's one of the, the, the other questions, no? Um, can all brands do what you've done? So, can any brand release control the way uh, both your brands did? Mm. Well, we have a, one, one of our clients in Berlin is a, is a automotive workshop. Like you, when you, you know, need snow tires or you need an oil change or whatever, you go to them. I don't want to name them, but in the, you know, the car repairs thing, um, these guys don't have a Facebook page. And it's a good thing that they don't, because as soon as they opened up this channel with the, with the consumer, um, the consumer will just bring, bring complaints. And either you teach everyone how to become an auto mechanic or how to become an engineer, and they understand what's wrong with their car, or they understand the service, or whatever. Or people start to complain about, you know, I changed my tires, but now my engine doesn't work. And, and so in, the, in this, this kind of consumer uh, discussion, needs to happen really, really face-to-face -face and with the car present. Um, and the, the mechanic can explain in analog ways uh, what, what people, social media experts, cannot. So there's one example where uh, social media would, it would be a disaster for a, a client. The, on the other side, CNN, um, they spoke to us about handling their, their social media stuff in Germany. And honestly, we didn't know where to start. And actually, our client runs the Facebook page for CNN, and what he does as a client is he uses Facebook for news. You know, when something happens, like Tahir Square is going crazy again, he puts that on Facebook, and he uses the social media channels as a way to, to drive, uh, or to impulse, uh, to drive um, people to watch, you know, to turn on TV or to go to CNN.com. And so often, sometimes I think it's a, it's, a brand, it's a disaster for a brand, and sometimes I think it's even a disaster for an ad agency, that the client themselves should, should actually start to, to connect with the consumer, but not even to, to, to talk, but rather to inform. Yeah. I think in your example, I mean, using, using the viewers, uh, those that want to engage, and giving them the possibility to do that and to be seen uh, with, with all the beauty in that, uh, is to me, uh, what you're doing is you're enabling the brief to be relevant in act through delivery. Yeah. Uh, so to me, I think that works as sort of a crowd-sourced uh, mm -hmm. content way. I don't think everything is about you know co-creation uh, because that's not the solution to all problems. There are businesses that should be elitist, that should present a vision uh, like high fashion. Uh, I don't want to have a democratized wardrobe. Uh, I want someone's vision. Yeah. So I think that def I don't, I'm not sure all banks should do this. I don't think the army perhaps should do this. Uh, I think there are a lot of businesses that should stay away from the idea of doing things collaboratively, mm -hmm. but I don't think they should stay away from listening to their consumers and being transparent. And that's another issue. I think opening up and listening and uh, acknowledging the fact that they are not consumers, they are people, they're going to talk about us, you can at least listen. Uh, so I, I think all businesses need to have a social media strategy, at least, and a digital strategy, because otherwise you're living before the internet. Mm. Uh, and sorry, that age 
does not exist anymore. Mm. But crowd creation and transparency and being open and listening and, and uh, being open-minded, th those are not the same for me. Yeah. We, we've looked at great examples, no? Uh, what about major failures? Uh, we were talking before about the Pepsi refresh case, when in 2010 Pepsi decided uh, boldly to abandon uh, traditional media advertising. So I'm going to take my $20 million and I'm going to put it into community programs and I'm going to get people to, um, uh, to interact with them, to propose, to involve themselves, etc., etc. Uh, and they went down, they lost 5% of the market share. Uh, that turns out something like $350 million in the States. Uh, they went from second place to third place. What happened? W w why isn't that a success story? It's funny that it's, it's a success story, in uh, social media terms, they, they, they increased uh, Facebook fans for like 80,000 people. Well, well, these astronomic figures you see uh, being thrown around, but they lost 5% of their sales. What happened? I think the, the, the move they made was uh, naive, uh, stupid, and unprofessional. Uh, Relying only on people's conversation without having the manifestation in real life is stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the first thing. You have to understand that what people talk about is always something that happens in reality and vice versa. And when it comes to br building brands such as Pepsi or Coke or Nike and a lot of these brands, um, they really benefit from the brand story that they actually can paint in traditional media. Uh, actually, people won't say that, but they want these dreams of brands uh, because they represent something that is good. So going totally into the conversation part and cutting off reality or uh, the non-digital, uh, to me, is uh, uh, stupid, uh, totally stupid. But I think that's what you see a lot of times when new things, new opportunities arise, that people are overly ambitious and mm. super positive and sort of direct everything. Because I, I basically think that they saw that with the money they could use, that they used, used to buy media for, if they put that in digital, they could do, they could like own the internet. A much bigger space, yeah. Yeah, so I think they were very rational. Uh, which, of course, is stupid. You should have some emotion. Uh. No, maybe they overbelieved their own promise. No? They thought, if I can refresh communities, people will connect that to refreshing my brand promise of a soft drink, etc., etc. So. But it's like when McDonald's opened up, not the good example, but the bad example. I'm going to take that first. You can take the good example. <laughs> okay. But when they did the MACD stories where they wanted people to, to just tell what, say what they wanted about McDonald's, and obviously there's a, a huge clump of people that think McDonald's is not, you know, the most beautiful company in the world. Which makes, they made, they made a, a platform for people to hate them publicly. Um, I think it's uh, counterproductive from a branding point of view, and very amusing, because they, they thought that everybody loved them. They didn't do the listening part. It's like when you come to a party where you don't know anyone. You don't start out by going into the middle of the room and pulling up the microphone and just scream that I know you love me because everybody's going to hate you. You kind of mingle for a few, you know, you listen. And then, okay, this is what's relevant, oh, you know. Uh, and usually big uh, corporations and big brands are very tone deaf to ordinary people's conversation. But then they did something good. I'm, I'm thinking of ask. Oh yeah, the the yeah, our questions, your answers. I mean, sorry, your questions, our answers. In this mm -hmm. case. Yeah. No, I mean, this is cool in Canada, where you know they answered every single question that people had, every single problem that they had, and they made a little video, like a little commercial out of that, and they just flattened, you know, they flattened the the whole kind of case against them, which is amazing. But I mean, that was also like I think in the in the in the digital space, um, somewhere in there. Somewhere in your interaction with the brand, you have to feel a human. You have to connect with some flesh and blood. And I think that's, in that case, you do that. There's someone that, that sees you and says, ah, Patrick, I see your question. I've made a film. Um, and it's quite amazing. Like, I'm from South Africa, and there was this massive uh, success story with an online shop which was selling kitchen stuff, knives and 
you know, saucepans and all that. And they, they, just, they just boomed and boomed and boomed. They're like the, one of the best startups in Africa. And they said, like, what is, your, what is your secret? Like, what is your social media strategy? How did you spread yourself on the internet? And they said, no, no, no. Their, their secret weapon is this guy with great handwriting who writes, when you order something, he writes a note like, hey, Patrick, here are your knives. I hope you enjoy them. If you have any problems, call me. Signed it and put his phone number on there. And people saw the human. And they, they ordered again and again and again. I think it was like 60% 60, 60 reorder from people. So, um, and that's probably the, the problem with Pepsi. You know, they, they see a brand and they see pixels, but they're not really, they're not seeing it, the face or, or, or the flesh and blood or the beating heart of somebody on the other side, perhaps. So if, you, if you're human, you can be genuine, no? If you can sure. show that, that human side, that's sure. where we can answer that question, no? Sure. I mean, like with Pepsi, on the pe one side, Pepsi was taking all their money and putting it to social. Parallel, uh, Coke was making uh, a vending machine which two people had to work together to get two Cokes. I mean, that, that's beautiful and analog well, it was and, in India and, and true. Pakistan, no? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, well, it, used, yeah. it was South America, wherever. But that was really analog, and, and they, were, they were talking about love and, and supporting each other at the same time when, you know, when Pepsi were doing it in a pixel way. I'm, I'm receiving signals from non-digital signals <laughs> from in front of me. We should be wrapping up, is that... Uh, just one last question then. Um, can brands be our friends? I mean, if we're talking of being, of being genuine, can brands be our friends here? So, is Sweden really being nice to people, uh, talking to them through Twitter? Is, is, is it a genuine relationship, do you think? Or was the CNN being nice to people, letting them talk? Or was it just some sort of exercise that there was no real humanity behind it? I, I think, in, uh, I mean, in Sweden's case, it's not about being friendly. It's about showing a picture of a nation that consists of more interesting persons than this person. Uh, ordinary people, horny people, stupid people, brilliant people, childish people, a nation of individuals. And Sweden lacked that association. So we, we did deliver that. I don't know if you want to be friends to that country, but I think you want to be friends with people that are honest and open. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, I think you can be friends with Sweden from that sense. I'm not sure we demand of people to be friends, but we give the opportunity. And I think all brands can give the opportunity. Well, I'll finish just with one last question. Uh, was something we talked about at lunch, reading a quote from John Hegarty, <laughs> uh, going back to the traditional advertisers. He said once, well, recently, he said, to those brands that say, I understand you, I say, fuck off, you don't understand me. Mind your own business. I don't want to be understood by you. I don't understand myself uh, sometimes, and it can be fun. What would you say to Sir John Hegar Hegarty right now? Fuck off. No, no. <laughs> um, no, uh, he, yeah, it, it, he, he's got a strong, a strong point there coming from it, definitely from a more traditional way. I, I don't feel the same as him. I think brands need to understand people, but they don't have to tell them that we understand you. That's where I agree with him. I always think about it like this. Back to your other question as well. If you want a brand to be a friend, then think about what you look for in a friend. What does a friend do? Number one, makes you laugh. Or fascinates you. Or gives you something. Or like someone that knocks on your door, comes to your party, you didn't invite them. You hate them until they say, champagne. You love them. So a brand has to make me laugh, fascinate me, or give me a gift. And then it will be my friend. And that's where I disagree with Mr. Mr. Hegarty. And I think this is, this is the, the challenge these days for brands, is to, to be human and to make friends in a human way, not a digital way, but in a human way on digital platforms and in a digital age. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Do we have time for a couple of questions? Or? Sure. Hello, thank you for great talks. Um, Patrick, this is a question for you. Um, I'm a brand strategist from Toronto, Canada, so I completely understand being from a country where there are very limited perceptions of the brand. Um, and I thought it was a really compelling way to let go of control and to build the positive perceptions and sort of take to a new place this idea of being authentic and open. My question is, 
Um, is there, we're talking about sort of the external perceptions and how to build those perceptions. So what's the internal branding opportunity here for Sweden? I, and I really love the idea of conveying that there's individualism, but if we're going to be authentic, what does that mean internally if there's naive remarks around certain communities to be authentic and open? Is there anything to be done internally where you can build a more, I don't know, a message internally about being inclusive um, to minority communities? I think, um, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> the platform that we built the campaign on that we had to prove had existed for over two, two three years when we got the brief. And uh, this is just a small thing of, among a lot of campaigning that's done on this platform. platform. Uh, but this was the first time it actually was exactly the platform. Totally progressive, totally transparent, and totally authentic. Uh, and it taught our clients a lesson that they were very proud of. So they've started working internally totally different. Everything now uh, that's run from the SE and Visit is benchmarked to how can we do it uh, in this way as to not corrupt the, the, the message that we're building. And I think it's built a lot of uh, pride and confidence on the client side and in the organizations. I know that our foreign minister, Carl Bildt, is very proud of it, even though he has uh, definitely uh, been attacked uh, from the account, actually. Uh, so that's one thing. I think culturally it has changed the way that they should work with their brand platform. Uh, when it comes to Sweden, the, the project has spurred discussions on is this good or bad for the image. People reject the fact that we have had uh, uh, homosexuals and immigrants. and there are, there are a lot of ignorant people in Sweden as well. But the debate that this activity or project has spurred has uh, actually, I think, benefited to the, to, to the sense of pride that most progressive Swedes uh, uh, are. So, uh, but apart from that, um, I don't really know what to answer. Thank you very much. Thanks, Miles. Thanks, Patrick. Thank well, you. Well.